Good evening to everyone and to our online guests as well. Um, and welcome to Book Breaks. Book Breaks are organized by the Library Committee. And we um, do uh, books. We introduce authors of books, authors writing in English, and mostly about Japan. So if anybody here wants to pitch a book, we, we, we would love it. And um, I, my name is Suvendrini. I'm a journalist, and I'm a member of the Library Committee. Today, of course, we finally have a book on kawaii. And it's called Irresistible, and the author is uh, Professor Joshua Paul Dale, who teaches at uh, Chuo University. The book, of course, is, um, is, is, is the first, as, as we talked a little bit, the first research done on this uh, Japanese term kawaii, which is you know, actually global. And the library committee got very interested when we saw the title and thought this would be perfect um, on, on how we could dissect this, this, um, this seemingly very simple uh, word. So the floor is open to Dr. Um, Dr. Joshua Dale. But before that, just let me uh, introduce our next book break, book break, which is going to be very different to the topic today. It's, um, it's called the, the, context, the, the Contest for Japan's Economic Future. And it's by Richard Katz, who writes a lot about Japan and politics, global politics. So that's going to be in February, by the way. Um, and so we open the floor to, uh, to Joshua, who will tell us all about how this whole term came and how the Japanese kawaii is adopted globally. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for that introduction. And I wanted to say thank you to the Library Committee of the FCCJ for inviting me here today. Um, and also to thank you to Moriwaki-san, who is an able organizer and uh, had did a, we exchanged a lot of detailed emails before today. So thank you very much. I'm going to just first attempt to start. Um, let's try the first slide. Wonderful. OK, and before I begin, I just wanted to mention that, as you can see here, this slide is an illustration designed by Yukiko Toda, who did all the illustrations at the beginning of each chapter in the book. And she's joining us today, so I'm really oh. glad that she's here. And she did a wonderful job. Thank you. <clears throat> she gave me a lot of help in the research as well, as you'll find out. So I'm going to read uh, excerpts from three chapters today. And the first one is about cute studies. Tokyo, my home for several decades, is continually evolving, the new replacing the old at a frantic pace. Many old buildings that would be preserved elsewhere don't stand a chance here. Harujuku, a nearby neighborhood, has long been the center of youth culture. Built a year after the great Tokyo earthquake in 1924, its train station looked like a European chalet half timbered with an ornate clock, stained glass, and a weathercock topping its cupola. By some miracle, it survived the firebombing of the Second World War, only to be torn down and replaced with a soulless glass box in 2020. But the atmosphere of Harajuku is created by people as much as buildings. And this was a place where young people who didn't fit into the mainstream could express themselves. Throughout the 1990s, dozens of aspiring rock bands set up on the Harajuku streets every Sunday to perform. And this became the epicenter of Japan's fashion tribes, groups of like-minded young people who dressed not to conform, but to express themselves. The most noticeable were young women who wore dresses with long skirts that puffed out with ruffles and lace. Frilly corsets narrowed their waists, and they wore elaborately styled wigs in different colors, blonde, red, even blue, festooned with ribbons. I often saw them gathered on a bridge over the train tracks, taking photos of each other dressed as a crazy mix of French Rococo and British Victorian. They looked like living dolls. They called themselves Lolitas. I found this name baffling. 
It obviously came from Vladimir Novikov's novel, but why would they choose to call themselves this? To find out, I turned to Yukiko, Yukiko Toda, uh, who was a fashion designer for a Lolita brand. Nobody knows why they started using the term, she admitted, but Lolita fashion has nothing to do with attracting the attention of men. It's for the girls themselves. They dress up for each other because it's cute. The word she used was kawaii, and while cute is the best English translation, its meaning is more wide ranging. Kawaii in general was part of girls and women's culture in Japan. It also appeared in the manga comic books popular with everyone, even adults, and was a feature of Japanese animation. I knew a bit about kawaii, but it didn't really hold my interest at first. But then something changed. As a long-term resident of Japan, I've learned that a surprise often waits for you around every corner. 10 years ago, that meant a sudden change in road construction barriers, a common sight in every city. I never thought much about them until the day I walked out of my apartment to find the road blocked, not by a row of prosaic red and white stripes signaling danger, but by a long line of large plastic Hello Kitty characters, each holding a rainbow. This iconic cat, drawn simply with a large head, a red hair ribbon, and no visible mouth, made her debut adorning, adorning a coin purse in 1975. Her parent company, Sanrio, was soon producing a dizzying array of products that became globally popular. Hello Kitty is now one of the most profitable licensed characters in the world, and she shows up in many unlikely places. A Taiwanese airline painted an enormous Hello Kitty on its planes, and Lady Gaga wore a dress made entirely out of Hello Kitty toys in a 2009 photo shoot. So seeing the celebrated cat appear on road construction barriers wasn't a complete surprise. But I soon realized that this was more than just an advertising campaign. Cutified construction barriers were popping up everywhere in Tokyo, sporting frogs, monkeys, ducks, rabbits, and dolphins. It was a bizarre transformation of mundane city streets, and at first I couldn't figure out what was going on. This sudden culture shock, years after I landed in Tokyo, made me newly aware of the world around me. It was like a switch flipped in my brain. Suddenly I noticed that kawaii is everywhere in Japan. The manhole covers right outside my door are adorned with colorful portraits of manga characters. Animal cafes, where customers can receive a shot of cuteness along with their morning espresso, offer cuddles with cats, rabbits, miniature pigs, and even hedgehogs. Railway safety po po posters telling passengers to stand clear of the platform or to keep the station clean are illustrated by a small figure with a huge head and big eyes. And it's impossible to walk for more than a minute through a shopping street in Japan without overhearing the word kawaii, often explain, exclaimed in a chorus among groups of young women. In fact, kawaii might just be the most popular word in the Japanese language. Once I started noticing the extent to which cuteness has permeated Japanese culture, I wanted to understand it. When did it, its relentless spread begin? And why did it happen here? The bustling port city of Yokohama hosts an annual celebration of cuteness called the Bekachu Outbreak. For a whole week every August, parades of up to 2,000 life-size costume Pikachus and other characters from the Pokemon video games march in front of tens of thousands of spectators from all over the world. I decided I had to go and see it for myself. Surely this would be the perfect place to find out why kawaii is so incredibly popular. The Pokemon craze began in 1996. Like most adults at that time, I was only vaguely aware of it, in my case, through the passion of my young nieces and nephews. A game that involves catching cute little monsters and making them fight, Pokemon was inspired by the tradition among Japanese children of going out into local parks to catch horned stag beetles. When the wildly popular video game Pokemon Go appeared in 2016, I was bemused at the sight of hordes of people silently wandering the streets, staring at their smartphones. 
but it wasn't strange for them. Many of Pokemon's 90s fan base never grew out of their favorite game. A succession of multimedia cross-platform productions has kept them engaged for two decades, and Pokemon is often cited as the highest grossing media franchise of all time. As the Pokemon March began in Yokohama, I turned to people in the crowd and started asking questions. But no matter who I talked to or where they were from, whether Japan or another East Asian country, Europe, the US or Australia, every conversation followed the same path. I'd ask them what they liked about the parades and they'd talk about how cute they thought Pikachu was. But when I asked what made Pikachu cute, the conversation would come to a stuttering halt. Everyone was firmly convinced that Pokemons were cute, yet no one seemed to be able to explain why. There seems to be something about cuteness that resists interpretation. Everyone knows it when they feel it, but even the people who design the stuff can't explain why a tiny change makes one iteration of a design cuter than another. Hello Kitty, a legendary character from the 1970s, was de designed by Yuko, Yuko Shimizu, she made several initial drawings, but only knew she was onto something when her assistant pointed to one in particular and screamed, Kawaii! I needed help in figuring out exactly what made Pokemon cute. And luckily, I had brought an extrovert along. Yukiko Toda, as an artist and fashion designer who has been expressing Kawaii in her work for over a decade. Together, we watched the parades and paid close attention every time the crowd rose up in a collective cry of kawaii. After a while, we started to notice some patterns. First, the Pokemons were surprisingly small. I'm six feet tall and I towered over them. Their eyes were placed low enough to make their foreheads bulge, and their cheeks were highlighted with red circles, characteristics that Yukiko immediately identified as kawaii. She also pointed out that their open mouths, which I had thought were simply smiling, had a more ambiguous expression. They look like a baby bird opening its mouth to be fed, she said, but it's a blank look. You can't tell what they're feeling or thinking. Hello Kitty, with no mouth at all, has that same affectless expression that is still somehow appealing. Plus, the Pokemon's furry bodies were invitingly soft, Whenever an individual Pokemon posed for photos, children and even some adults would run up and hug it unrestrainingly. The adult's behavior surprised me because hugging is not a common greeting among Japanese adults. But Yukiko explained that furry life-size mascots of all sorts are a standard feature of public events in Japan. And running up to hug them is a behavior that everyone has indulged in since childhood. Since it's not common in Japan to hug friends or even family, it must be nice to give rein to the impulse to hug a giant ball of fur once in a while. As the parade began, we noticed that along with their huge heads, the Pokemons had small bodies with stubby arms and legs so short they were barely able to shuffle along. Their severely limited eyesight meant that they were constantly bumping into each other and even falling over. And these accidental collisions always caused a crescendo of kawaii from the besotted crowd. Yukiko and I were not the first people to notice that cute things share a set of common characteristics. Back in 1943, the Australian biologist Conrad Lawrence observed that certain animals, especially baby ones, incite the same impulse to provide care and protection that people feel towards young children. He drew up a set of traits he called the child schema, which included a large head relative to body size, large and low lying eyes, round bulging cheeks, short and thick extremities, a soft body surface with springy elastic consistency, and clumsy wobbly movements. Lawrence believed that these characteristics triggered an instinctual response that stimulated the nurturing and protective behavior in adults that children need to survive. If our brains are hardwired to feel a rush of cuteness upon encountering the child schema, then perhaps I was more of a puppet than the bright yellow Pikachus that were dancing in front of me. 
Lawrence believed that our response to cute objects is compulsive to being virtually irrepressible and operates automatically, like when a toilet flushes at the press of a lever. But I thought his theory sounded too extreme. After all, for every person who cries kawaii, there is likely to be another shrugging, shrugging their shoulders. We may all have the same capacity to respond to cuteness, but not everyone is into it. Plus, I'm skeptical about the idea that seeing something cute always gives rise to the impulse to nurture or protect it. Although the basic elements of Lorenz's child schema were borne out by my observations of the Pikachu outbreak, there still seemed to be something missing from his theory. A conga line of Pikachus didn't make me feel like taking care of them or protecting them. Instead, the sight simply made me want to join in, join in with the fun. What did this response have to do with making sure humans evolved to take care of babies? If cuteness is all about an irresistible instinct to nurture, then the watching crowd surely, have, surely should have involuntarily leapt forward to help the fallen Pikachus. But that didn't happen. And when you think about it, a child in need of real help, suffering and in pain, is not cute either. Some scientists have concluded that the feeling of kawaii encourages affiliation, which is social bonding in a broader sense than just nurturing. This is why feeling that something is cute makes us want to get closer to it, even if we have no particular desire to protect or nurture it. I was starting to wonder if cuteness deserved an entirely new field of study. Okay, this next section, this next chapter is called The Border Between Wild and Tame. Holding a baby fox in my arms should have been the highlight of my visit to Zal Fox Village, but I was disappointed. I expected the cub to play with me as a kitten or lick my hand and wriggle in excitement like a puppy. Instead, it just sat there and waited to be put down so it could run back to its siblings. But even though its behavior was a letdown, its appearance was anything but. So small and fluffy, such big ears. The other people sitting around me were clearly as excited as I was. We were gathered in a circle of chairs and we all wore bright green plastic ponchos to keep the animal's gamey smell off our clothes. Cries of kawaii and cute, along with an abundance of cooing, indicated that the group was overwhelmed by cuteness and I couldn't help smiling. This happy communal experience, however, was not shared by the fox itself. As the staff from the center took photos, the fox cub sniffed my poncho before staring into the distance. It was clear that I was being tolerated rather than loved. Sal Fox Village opened in 1990 with a population of foxes brought from Hokkaido in the far north of Japan. It now has more than 100 foxes that roam freely in an open air reserve covering nearly 2000 square yards. I went to the center to investigate the connection between humans and animals that are habituated to people, but still wild. Although some people think of foxes as pests, others see them as cute. Their tails are appealing, appealingly bushy, thick fur makes their faces appear wider, seeming to hide chubby cheeks, and they often appear to be smiling. But I wondered how this perception would affect my relationship with them. I could walk amongst the foxes without disturbing them, but how close to them would I feel? At the entrance to the fox sanctuary was a high gate of chicken wire festooned with warning signs. Most of the signs are illustrated with cute figures of boys and girls with fox heads engaging in prohibited behavior with the animals. In this way, the sign suggests that entering the enclosure will somehow make you a fox part of their world, yet unaccustomed to their manners and mores. Since the foxes may bite, one of the most important rules is not to hold out your hand to them, but I had to constantly fight the impulse to do so. I instinctively wanted to make friends with these creatures. I stuck both hands in my pockets, where my fingers encountered the plastic packets of food pellets I'd bought. Don't squeeze the food packs is another rule. Foxes are smart enough to know what the crinkling sound signifies and will leap up to bite the food. 
it was hard to obey this regulation as well. Surrounded by so much cuteness, I found myself wanting to squeeze something. <clears throat> Human visitors to the center tend to approach the foxes as if they're pets. Everyone I saw was walking slowly with smiling, open faces, keen for as much contact with the animals as possible. But like the fox cub on my lap, the adult foxes ignored us. The many YouTubers who come to film South Fox Village are frustrated by the fox's indifference, but they found a solution that makes for more interesting videos. They break all the rules posted at the gate. After all, the foxes will approach people if they think they're going to be fed. YouTube is full of peep videos of people holding out food to make the foxes approach so that they will act as well as look cute. But it was becoming clear to me that the foxes may look cute, but they don't act that way. In order to leave the fox village, <clears throat> one passes through the gift shop. It sells fox clocks, wind chimes, biscuits, toys, and stickers. All of these souvenirs depict the foxes as we would prefer to see them, waving hello, posing jauntily, and smiling as if they really mean it. In other words, engaging with us in all the ways that the real foxes do not. Although the foxes of Zal Fox Village have been living close to humans for decades, they are still wild. In folklore around the world, foxes are close to humans, but also distant. They seem capable of being friendly, but they never take that first step. This seemingly untapped potential prompted a unique experiment that brings us significantly closer to unraveling the mystery of how companion animals became our friends. The story begins in 1952 with Dmitry Belayev, a scientist who ran the Central Research Laboratory on fur breeding animals in Siberia. Belayev <clears throat> was an outlaw scientist in Stalin's USSR, a geneticist at a time when the entire field was considered fake science. Its practitioners were stripped of their positions, exiled, or even imprisoned. Yet Belayev was determined to contribute more to science than lustrous fox fur coats. Anyone who has raised a dog or a cat knows they have distinct personality traits. In running the fox farms, Belayev noticed that the behaviors that foxes demonstrated as cubs, from curiosity to fear, aggression, or even docility, continued into adulthood. If he started deliberately selecting foxes that showed less fear of humans and then breeding them together, the eventual result might be foxes that demonstrated calmness as an inherited trait from birth. Belayev's hypothesis was that this would eventually dampen down the fight or flight response by altering the physiological systems governing hormones and neurotransmitters that influence behavior. In other words, his foxes might eventually become genetically tame. He was well aware that this experiment would take decades at the very least. And plus, research in genetics was banned in Stalin's Russia, which required Belyaev to lie about his project. The official paperwork listed it as an attempt to improve fur production of the silver fox. Had the truth been revealed, his experiment would have ended immediately. When Belyaev began his experiment, the farm foxes demonstrated a range of behaviors towards people. About 30% were extremely aggressive. Only 10% were quiet and curious. However, even the foxes that seemed benign were prone to biting the staff, who wore thick protective gloves whenever they went near them. Like many wild animals, foxes breed once a year. Changes in their behavior were expected only after many years, but to the researchers' surprise, aggressive and fearful behaviors were eliminated in just a few generations. The real surprise came in 1963, with the fourth generation of controlled breeding. A single fox tub, cub began to wag its tail at the approach of humans, a behavior never before seen in foxes. As it progressed, the Siberian experiment continued to yield even more incredible results. In 1965, the sixth generation was born, and some of these cubs displayed a range of dog-like behaviors 
including trying to nuzzle their caretakers and licking their hands, rolling on their backs, hoping for belly rubs, and whining when they were left alone. In the eighth generation, there was another key change. Some of the cubs were born with curly tails, a, train, a trait seen not only in dogs, but other domesticated animals, such as pigs. They also retained pup-like behavior, being extremely playful and boldly curious about everything for twice as long as wild cubs. When the 10th generation of cubs was born in 1969, two more surprising changes appeared. The first was their ears. All fox cubs are born with floppy ears, but they straighten out after the first couple of weeks of life, an important survival trait for a species that hunts by listening for the small noises made by its prey. But one cub retained her floppy ears as she grew up and passed this on to the next generation. The other new trait was fur color. One male cub had a white star in the middle of his forehead, and thereafter this became increasingly common as well. White coloration, called piebald, is common to many domesticated animals, including dogs, cows, horses, and cats. My own cat, Toby, has a white patch on his forehead that makes him easy to spot from far away, even in the dark, which is precisely why most wild animals don't have such coloring. By the early 1970s, the stress levels of the level of stress hormones in Balea's foxes was about half that of wild foxes. Their adrenal glands were smaller and their serotonin levels higher, making for happier animals. And by the mid 1980s, striking physical changes began to appear. The friendliest foxes' snouts and upper jaws shorten and their skulls widen. Along with curling, their tails became even shorter and more bushy, bushier, and their heads significantly smaller. They were becoming as tame as dogs. The success of Bell Ives' experiment has seemingly resulted in a newly domesticated species. Foxes that eagerly approach humans, remain tame throughout their lives, and pass that quality on to the next generation. To meet three of these tame Siberian foxes, I traveled to California, from the sun-drenched desert up into the cool mountains of San Diego, to the JAB Canid Education and Conservation Center. I was met by Amy and Dave Bassett, a couple with a passion for animal conservation, and they introduced me to three domesticated Siberian foxes, which they had adopted, uh, Silver Mikhail, Red Victor, and Moxa, a Georgian white. The foxes live in an outdoor fenced area with room to run and a shed for shade. When they were left let out, they rushed over to sniff me. This was a huge difference from the foxes of Zal Fox Village. I felt an immediate connection with these foxes. They wanted to be friends. Just as I was bonding with the Siberian foxes, Amy and Dave brought another fox into the enclosure. This was Ishi, a US fox that had been rescued from a fur farm as a pup and hand raised by people. Ishi is habituated to humans, but not genetically tame. When she came into the enclosure, she did a circuit of the outer edge and then retreated under a bench. So I don't have a picture because I couldn't <laughs> never get a clear picture of her. Although she is younger and smaller than the Siberian foxes, she wins most dominance interactions with them because she bites harder. Ishi's tameness is a bit like a software patch. It works most of the time, but if it fails, her behavior can change in a heartbeat. The Siberian foxes, on the other hand, have different software altogether. Selective breeding has rewired their brains. Amy says, it's like they have a soul I look into their eyes and they look into mine and we see each other. She picked up Moxa and placed him in my arms. He looked up at me, up me, opened his jaws and moved his head towards my nose. Alarmed at the sight of an approaching mouthful of fox teeth, I leaned back in a panic, only for Moxa to reach out and gently take the tip of my nose in his mouth. At that moment, joy washed over me. An animal I had just met was saying an affectionate hello, not like a dog, but like a fox. I'd always thought cuteness was primarily a visual phenomenon. 
When Amy introduced me to Ishi, the rescue fox, she said Ishi's white face and black rim eyes and ears made her the cutest looking of all of their foxes. But when Ishi looked at me and promptly retreated under a bench, I was left unmoved. My cuteness response was triggered by the friendly behavior of Moxa, Victor, and Mikhail, the specially bred Ch、uh, Siberian foxes. Thanks to them, I began to think that cuteness was more than simply skin deep. Okay, this is the last chapter I'll read from The Future of Cuteness. <clears throat> Japanese girls have long been fond of writing letters to one another. In the 1970s, the fancy goods industry had huge success with notebooks and letter paper that featured cute designs, such as Hello Kitty. Mechanical pencils that produced fine, even lines also arrived on the market. These innovations were perfect for writing notes to friends, and schoolgirls responded by turning the old way of writing, a pillar of traditional Japanese culture, on its head. All students were taught to write Japanese vertically and in a calligraphic style that emphasized beauty and elegance. But schoolgirls, inspired by their new note paper, began to write horizontally and from left to right, like English and other European languages. They started to punctuate their messages by drawing hearts, stars, and faces with their mechanical pencils, little proto emoji, and sprinkled them with English words like love and friend to add extra cachet. When asked why they had developed this new style, the answer was invariably because it's kawaii. This highly stylized, cutified method was difficult both to write and to read. It drove teachers crazy. And some schools banned the writing style entirely. This rounded style of writing, with inserted little drawings and English words, was a rebellion against traditional Japanese culture. It was a new kawaii language, which girls used to express themselves freely and establish intimate relationships. It was so successful that many boys started to use it as well. As the 1980s progressed, this new script was used by magazines. In advertising and packaging, in manga cartoons, and Apple Macintosh added it as a font in their computers. Then, in the mid 1990s, pagers with text messaging capabilities appeared first, followed by mobile phones. And Japanese teenage girls were at the forefront of this communication revolution. Pagers had first been developed for on call doctors and businessmen, but they were enthusiastically adopted by young Japanese women. By 1996, 10 million people used them, a majority of whom were teenage girls. By then, the messaging functions on this, these devices had come to include hearts and smiley faces, proto emoji that recall the kawaii writing style developed by an earlier generation of girls in the 1970s. Emoji is a term derived from the Japanese words for picture and letter. Emoji arrived on mobile phones in the late 1990s, but there was a hitch. Each mobile phone company had its own different emoji palette. Sending emoji to a different mobile phone resulted in a string of random, unreadable characters. So boyfriends and husbands had to choose the same carrier as their female partners if they wanted to understand their text messages. Any new phone model that wasn't popular with women soon vanished from the market. The iPhone was a worldwide hit when it went on sale in 2007, apart from in Japan, where it failed miserably. The reason? There was no way of sending emoji in text messages. When Apple realized their mistake, they teamed up with Google to create an international standard for the little pictograms, which was introduced in 2011. As a result, much of the world is now happily expressing their feelings through tiny, cute images. A revolution in communication that originally developed out of the desire of Japanese schoolgirls to share their feelings through the medium of kawaii. Japanese teenage girls have also been influential in the cutification of another medium that has attained immense global popularity in youth culture manga, a central pillar of Japan's global cultural influence. The Kyoto International Manga Museum is located in a former elementary school. 
The only sound is the creaking of the old wooden floors as visitors browse the 300,000 volumes in their collection, the largest in the world. The number of shelves dedicated to each decade grows as more and more manga appear. By the 1960s, manga's explosion in popularity have left publishers in dire need of new artists. They responded by holding competitions that solicited contributions from readers, girls as well as boys. Unlike their male predecessors, the women who became shoujo manga artists had been girls who loved reading it. They knew what girls wanted. In 1972, Ryoko Ikeda launched her 11-volume manga series, The Rose of Versailles. Over the course of some 1,700 pages, it told the epic story of the French court until the revolution, through the eyes of Marie Antoinette and a dashing commander of the guards named Oscar, who was actually a girl who had been raised as a boy. This gender fluidity is typical of girls' manga. And it's one reason why young men who felt alienated from Japan's rigid standards of masculinity and its presumption of heterosexuality increasingly found themselves drawn to it. The Rose of Versailles was read by practically every girl in Japan. When Oscar was killed off, it was reported that teachers across the country were forced to cancel classes because all the girls were sobbing uncontrollably. The culture of kawaii wouldn't have traveled so far or so easily if the values it expressed, so evident in girls' manga, hasn't resonated so widely. Its ideals of cooperation and communication flow from valuing cuteness, a quality that finds power in the small and vulnerable, the childlike and unthreatening. A steady job, marriage, and children are some of the traditional markers of adulthood, but for many people this is changing. Jobs are precarious, while getting married and starting a family are often postponed or deferred as more and more adults seek to prolong their youth. These desires are reflected in the surrounding culture as the boundaries between children and adults become blurred. And cuteness seems increasingly to be showing up in the adult world. Fan conventions often include people who dress up as their favorite fictional characters, so much so that the word cosplay a portmanteau of costume and play first employed in Japan, is now used worldwide. The young people who call themselves furries, however, dress up in head-to-toe animal costumes that are not connected to any particular character. Rather than being associated with a media franchise, these costumes are uniquely individual and very cute. My cousin Sarah has been a furry since she was 13 years old. When she decided to make and design the full-body animal costumes called fursuits, she moved to the suburbs of Cincinnati with seven fellow furry artists. I visited them before they headed to Pittsburgh for a major furry convention and spent a few afternoons chatting with my cousin and her friends about their cutified world. They first encountered the fandom on social media. Online, everyone takes another name. My cousin is known as Milky and creates a fursona, an anthropomorphic animal representation of the self. A fursona can be almost any animal, such as a dog, a fox, or a hybrid of the two. <clears throat> the Anthrocon Furry Convention in Pittsburgh is one of the largest in the world, over 9,000 furries. I had borrowed a fursuit from one of my cousin friends, so there I was, dressed as a lovable dog, with a light blue nose and paws. The crowd was full of dogs and dragons, foxes and unicorns, but everyone had the same problem. Fursuits are hard to see out of and move around in, and being wrapped in thick fur is hot and sweaty. Most fursuits have a small fan built into the snout that blows air towards the wearer's face, but that doesn't stop the sweat. Milling around in the convention hall with 2,000 other costume furries, there's no way to tell what people look like inside all that fur. You can't even tell how tall someone is. Is it a six foot tall person looking out that giraffe's eyes? Or might a five foot tall person be looking out from hidden holes in its neck? And why does it matter? Fursuits grant an anonymity in real life that is otherwise only found online. 
I spent a lot of time at the convention center, and just watching the fur-suited figures walk around was very calming, like bathing in a river of cuteness. Although there is a small but thriving furry scene in Japan, the newest form of cuteness here are more high-tech. A new generation of robots oh, thank you, is designed to appeal through their cuteness. The Lovat, its name is a combination of love and robot, is 17 inches tall and weighs nine pounds, about the same as a baby. This design spec is deliberately intended, as the website puts it, to bring you the cuteness. A Lovat coos when it's cuddled and laughs when it is tickled. For me, the furry robot rolled over, blinked its luminous eyes, and held out its small, flipper-like arms. I picked it up, and it retracted its wheels and blinked sleepily. It felt warm and soft in my arms. When I touched its nose, it cooed. These robots have more than 50 sensors all over their bodies, including touch receptors. They can scan an entire room and locate their owner. But they also have a diary function that records their sleeping and cuddling time. A video on the manufacturer's website suggests that if you receive a phone notification indicating that your elderly father hasn't recently hugged his robot, you might want to give him a call to check that he's okay. However, this sense of security comes at a cost. A lovat is priced at 500,000 yen, with a monthly fee of at least 10,000 yen for a connection to the cloud. As the anthropologist Daniel White points out, this cloud co connectivity in Lovats means that their souls reside outside their bodies. If one of the Lovats suffers irreparable damage, its personality can be downloaded into another body. These cute robots can now live forever. At a symposium where White shared this idea, a Japanese professor said she found it comforting because if she had a Lovat, she would worry what would happen to it if she could no longer care for it. Lovats are not alive, but neither are they merely mechanical collections of parts. The difference is not to do with the machine, it's within us. The neuroscientist Morten Kringlebach studies what happens in our brains when we perceive cute objects. He believes that it engages all of our senses and sparks rapid brain activity that focuses our attention so quickly we don't have time to recognize what we're encountering. But once they grab our attention, cute entities activate brain networks associated with empathy and compassion, as well as more complex social behaviors like caregiving and playful engagement. In this way, cuteness works through our senses to humanize other people and objects. Cuteness opens doors on our brains that would otherwise remain shut. It gives us an opportunity to experience another sort of existence, one in which we guard ourselves a little less and invite others in a little more. In a world that feels increasingly polarized, is this such a bad thing? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Lots of food for thought. So the <clears throat> floor is open for questions. You can come up to the microphone and uh, over here. Uh, yes. Okay. And identify yourself. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, just your name is fine. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you. Um, so I was watching a, a series on Netflix recently about babies. You might have come across it. And it talks about doing an MRI scan of a baby's brain, which was done for the first time, apparently, to see how, you know, which parts of the baby's brain are activated. Mm. Have you any idea if an MRI scan has ever been done on someone when they're in a kind of cute overload? You know, I'm just thinking oh, that speaks oh, directly okay. to your final point there, right? Um, what happens to the brain? There have only been a couple of MRI studies so far, because mm. uh, they're expensive. And as far as I'm aware, they've just showed people cute images uh, to see what happens to their brain. So cute overload is like a sensation of being overwhelmed by cuteness. I think that's a little more extreme than what they got in those experiments. Yeah. What they found is that uh, first 
cute objects attract our attention incredibly quickly, within one seventh of a second, which is faster than conscious thought is possible. But that doesn't uh, indicate or anything about our behavior. So in other words, the brain immediately pays attention to cute objects. And then there's time for a cognitive appraisal process in which we have time for reflection and figure out what, if anything, we're going to do. So the scientists who conducted those studies, uh, some of them, says that cute cuteness is like a Trojan horse in our brain. It like kind of sneaks in, and then it opens doors and gets us ready for these pro-social behaviors like empathy and compassion, caregiving, nurturing, and play. Uh, so it can open these doors that might otherwise remain shut. Yes, thank you. Yes, sure. I'm Elizabeth Hackford, and I'm also an author. Um, I've read your book, fantastically researched. I, I feel like it's almost a life work for you in some ways. Um, you ended just, that was the last page that you just read mm -hmm. from there, um, poses the question. And I just wondered, um, you've done all this great work, this groundbreaking work on cuteness and the evolution across Asia and America. Um, what's your next step? What's your next plan? I'd really love to know. It's, I mean, it's, this is the beginning, right? But what, what, what's <laughs> next? Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the compliments. And uh, in addition to writing this book, I've also helped to found a new field called Cute Studies. So I'm also um, connecting with scholars all over the world, and we're investigating in cuteness in many different areas and in different fields as well. It's one of the interesting things about it, and the reason I thought it deserved a whole new field is that you can study cuteness in so many different areas. It's in literature and art, but it's also in psychology, and it's in evolutionary science. Um, so I want to bring everyone together and then see what comes out. So I'm looking forward to more uh, uh, insights to come in the future. Anybody else? I have a question. Why, why Japan? Uh, can, can, I, can, can you go up? Because we're recording <laughs> it. Sorry, we're recording it. Okay, I can just I repeat the question. My <laughs> kangereba. All right. Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Ursula. I'm Welsh. I'm very used to British storybooks about animals, cute animals. But the phenomenon of kawaii mm. in Japan, why Japan? This is the question I want to ask. Why do you think Japan? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I do um, write about it at length in the book. Uh, I trace, well, the word kawaii is relatively modern, we think, at least in broad usage. Uh, but I trace the history of the aesthetic of kawaii in Japan all the way back to the Heian era, a full thousand years ago, especially considering works like the Pillow Book, which ha includes a list of adorable things. And that list is fantastic because it li it's um, a Pillow Book written by Seisho Nogan, who was an attendant to the Empress. And she wrote list of things that sh I think they were intended to entertain her Empress. And one of them was list of adorable things. Um, and it was things like uh, small birds, small flowers, the kind of uh, different kinds of behavior that small children engage in. Like if a small child walks by and its sleeves are far too long for its arms, that's a kind of an adorable thing. Or when uh, I think baby geese whose legs look far too long for their bodies, kind of amusing mismatches, things like that. If you look at the list of a whole, it's a remarkably complete articulation of an aesthetic of cuteness, and the first one that I've found in the world. Um, so I can't, there are many other reasons, but I think that because of that and because of other long standing artistic values in Japanese art and literature, cuteness found fertile ground here, or it, as it, whereas it didn't in the West. And another reason is quite possibly religion, because when you're looking at art and literature, it was heavily influenced by religion, which uh, in the West, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, just didn't do much with cuteness. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could ask you, Joshua, about what's the downside of cuteness? Ah, uh, yes, a journalist question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, there's definitely a downside. I kind of hinted at one in the last section about the Lovat, 
uh, the sensors it has and the way it can map every room in your house. It knows where all your furniture is. Mm -hmm. Sony's Ibo is the, exactly the same in its mm -hmm. capability. So these machines have uh, enhanced capabilities for surveillance because it's not like a digital assistant that sits in one place. They move around. Uh, so what happens to that data and who can get a hold of it? This is a big issue. I really think that the future of cuteness is going to be in a combination of robotics and AI. Um, learning machines that will appeal to us through their cuteness. Because cuteness can bridge the uncanny valley. You know, if a robot is too realistic, we feel like it's weird. Uh, but if it's cute, we kind of forgive the mistakes of cute entities mm. uh, like puppies or kittens or children. And so I think this is uh, both an interesting development and uh, it's one we should mm. be careful of. Yes, please. Thanks for your talk. My name is Peter Morris. I'm a, uh, my main job, I'm a lawyer, but sometimes I write for Asia Times. That, that's why I'm here. So, uh, yeah. So, could you elaborate uh, on the connection between religion and cuteness? Uh, that, that's the first question. And okay. if I can ask another one, uh, I just remember a long time ago, a friend of mine who studied psychology said that uh, cute means ugly but adorable. Have you ever heard any uh, that, that or? Uh, no, I mean there are ugly things that are also adorable, uh, and that's a, there are expressions in Japanese like kimo kawaii that express that. I, I think of it as when there are well, first of all, cuteness is an aesthetic quality that blends easy with easily with other qualities, um, because it it evokes this effective response in us, and so you can put on other characteristics, and if it still evokes that response, then we'll still call it cute. So that's why Japanese has so many compound terms that have to do with kawaii. Um, then for your first question, it's hard to prove a negative, so I can't really answer that much about Western culture. But in, in, in Shinto, the indigenous Japanese religion, there was this long tradition since the very beginning of uh, trying to appeal to the gods through entertaining them. And there used to be a term, uh, I think this was even before the Heian era, before Buddhism came to Japan, the court, functiona court functionary that was uh, a job it was to lies with the gods it was called an asobibe, like a, to play with the gods, playing with the play functionary. So those kinds of values of the value of play are just built into the spiritual tradition in Japan. And I think that's one of the things that allowed cuteness to flourish in the arts. People just enjoyed it, and that was enough uh, to, to have it keep going forward. Yes, please. I do so. Hi, my name is Yuki Koizumi. Um, do you think that there are a difference between Japanese uh, cute design and Western cute design? Because in the West, uh, there are so many products and that towards kids, and um, but in Japan, um, we have a tremendous uh, numbers of the cute design. But when I look at the design, it's completely different. Um, once um, I was work, working as a character designer, and then I was working for a character design for, um, uh, I think he was a veteran hockey player in Canada. Mm -hmm. And then I started uh, designing a character because I'm a Japanese, so when it comes to cuteness, it tied up with Pokemon or Pikachu or something like that. Then I created so many variations of the characters, but he didn't like it. So I observed, you know, uh, Western characters, which is more, I don't know, realistic mm -hmm. uh, in some way. Mm -hmm. And then also the facial expression is very uh, vivid. So do you think there are differences between Japanese, you know, uh, character design and then Western design? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's, it's a hard one to answer because the field of design is so vast. Um, and there are, you know, so I'll just throw out some generalizations. For one thing, I think that especially in, in the United States, uh, if you look at something like uh, American animation, like SpongeBob SquarePants, for example, 
cuteness is often presented with a twist, and they often twist it so much that it doesn't really appear cute at first glance. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I think about SpongeBob, I think about something that's funny rather than cute. Um, so things can, you can combine funny with cute, like I said before. But the question is, what do people feel when they look at it? In Japan, well, cute designs make people feel kawaii. And even if you have something like so, that's grotesque cute or ugly cute, if it's Japanese design, it will still usually make you feel kawaii. Now, sometimes people like to ride the edge, um, and some people might feel it's cute and some people don't. And that's fine too, because it gives people an opportunity for a conversation and to share opinions. In the United States, I find that it tends to skew more towards the other quality that they're combining and less towards the cute, so far. So if something is funny and cute, it's going to look maybe more funny and not with a few cute elements, but you don't really feel the cuteness. But I think this might be changing. Uh, when I talk to my uh, cousin and her friends who are all artists, I mean, granted they're in the furry world, so this is already suffused with cuteness, but they really get Japanese kawaii. In their designs, they don't only do fursuits, they also design all kinds of products that they sell. Um, and there have been fans of Japanese manga and anime for since they were kids. They really understand kawaii, and they are able to blend the two aesthetics together. So I think that in the future, we'll find more and more combinations coming up. Yeah, hi, uh, great presentation. My name is Doug. Uh, last summer, we brought Gumachan to uh, Anime Expo in LA. And if you know Gumachan, the kawaii uh, character from Gumakan. Oh, OK, OK. Very, very kawaii. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we brought Gumachan. Gumachan came, and a couple of ladies were dressed up as Gumachan dancing in the booth. What shocked me to no end was when Gumachan was dancing, how many American adults would stop and go cute or kawaii or whatever. Adults, not kids. So my question is, what do you think has changed or what has given this interest or um, love of kawaii to adults in the U.S., not kids, but adults? Mm -hmm. I, I think it depends on the generation. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm talking 12 to 50. I saw someone. I saw. Okay. Um, well, I think that cuteness is ascendant in American culture, but in a very, um, in a way that many people are not aware of yet. I, I think that Americans are also surrounded by cuteness, not as much as we are in Japan, but still, it's in many, many places, but they have failed to notice it so far. When you point it out to them, or you put it in front of them, then you see that people really like these things. Um, but when you just ask someone out of the blue, they'll go, oh yeah, the make kawaii is a thing in Japan, but not here. But uh, once they start thinking about it, then they realize it is there. So it has this kind of, it's sort of sneaking in under people's radar. And I think that awareness will grow uh, as time goes on, but it's already there. Do you think there's a potential that it was always there, but you were afraid to let it out? Okay. The question was, was it always there, but were people afraid to let it out? Quite possibly, yeah. I mean, in the 70s, for example, there was actually a lot of cuteness in the hippie movement in the 70s, wearing flowers in your hair, the clothing, things like that. But it was also an era of political ferment and uh, attempted revolution, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of other things were going on, and there was a huge, is still, a huge aesthetic of cool which is more about like distancing and making and drawing back rather than drawing close like cute. So there are competing elements going on. And uh, actually, we were talking about Japanese men's fashion uh, before this event. In Japan, people have, uh, especially men, have more freedom in their fashion choices. So kawaii elements are very often appear in Japanese men's fashion. In the United States, I think men are a lot more cautious uh, because they're afraid of verbal or physical harassment. So yeah, there is some fear. Yes, over here. Uh, Philomena Keat. Um, uh, you're talking about different forms of kawaii, like gro you know, a bit grotesque kawaii or something. I wonder if you'd come across Sharon Kinsella's research. And I remember her talking about um, the children who, um, the young girls who walked like pigeon toe mm -hmm. and relating it to, you know, feeling uh, like like a baby or something, feeling sorry for them and protective, like and related to kawaii so. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little about that. And also, um, you know, it's 
it's quite normal for children to love cute things. Mm -hmm. But what does it say about, especially in Japan, where it's much more normal for adults to surround themselves by little characters? And is it in any way a rebellion against the responsibilities of adulthood? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was, uh, that was Sharon Kinsella's theme in her 1995 essay called Cuties in Japan, which is an excellent essay, and I really recommend reading it even now. She did tie kawaii to kawaii-so in that essay. I think she tied it together a little bit too tightly, and I'm basing this on survey data. When you ask people today if they think kawaii and kawaii-so are connected, they say no. I mean, there are different words for different concepts. Um, and then your other question was about, oh, right, right, okay. So about adults taking up cuteness. I think there's a difference between childish and childlike. And I think it depends on the individual. Uh, Sharon Kinsella was writing about childish behavior, which sometimes appears, but it never, to me, it seems like it, the booms in Japan kind of end quickly in childish behavior. Maybe people get tired of it, <laughs> it goes away. But childlike is something else. Um, these days, I think if you say that it might be useful or, or um, good if adults indulge in some childlike behavior, uh, people might mostly agree with you. And uh, I think it also could be a good thing. So cuteness allows us to be a little bit less serious, a little bit more indulging of ourselves as well as other people in a kind of lighthearted way. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> Sorry, I didn't introduce myself before. My name's Beth. Uh, I'm a journalist at Bloomberg. Um, so my second question is, I, I read or I heard recently something about cute kind of taking hold in a society that had experienced the trauma of war. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, Japan's experience with World War II might, in your view, have given rise to its kind of preeminence in, in cuteness kind of globally. And the second question, just tangentially from that, is which countries do you think are likely or are already seeing a kind of big kind of surge in, in cuteness and that may kind of even end up taking Japan's mantle there? Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm uh, familiar with a couple of different iterations of that theory. And one of them I like is by an anime scholar called Thomas Lamar who says that in Japan, after the war, um, there was a focus, especially in manga, on childlike characters and uh, um, cute characters. And he said it represented a possibility of renewal for, the, uh, for many people in Japan. Because when you have characters that are very young, they have a, you don't know what's in store for them in the future. And because they can grow and develop and change, and that's what Japan needed after the war was growth, development, and change, especially political change. <clears throat> so cuteness could represent that kind of hopeful feeling of uh, uh, untapped potential that could develop further. And then, oh, well, for what country could assume the mantle of cuteness after Japan? Uh, I would probably have my eye on China. Uh, cuteness is, kawaii is coming to China, and uh, cuteness as well. And you know, I have Google Scholar alerts for cute, cuteness, kawaii, uh, many permutations. I'm reading a lot of papers by uh, um, Chinese scientists about robotics and cuteness. Uh, so uh, this is definitely an area that they're looking into. All right. Yeah, I was... Um yeah, I was really interested in this thing of how cuteness brings empathy and makes us better people. And I was just wondering, because everything seems to be adrift now, you know, whether cuteness will then catch on even faster in our world. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on that note, if there's no, but no, no other questions, do you, you want another one? Or you could ask him... Um, the, the editor came to me. Um, yeah. I'd been interviewed in an article in The Guardian, and he saw it and then reached out and asked if I was interested in publishing a book. I was lucky. It's a really good publisher. It's profiled books in London. So it's really the trend, obviously, if, because the book was published last year, right? In October uh, yeah. of 2023, yeah. 
Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for a wonderful talk, opening the doors. If you have any last comments. I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I reiterate.